So again, thank you for coming and taking your time out, your precious time on a Sunday morning to listen to this Dharma talk. Uh, today I want to talk about something that might seem what you would say obvious and a lot of Dharma is indeed very obvious if we take the time to look. But my theme word today is the word uncover uncovering. I looked in the dictionary and there are so many words that are both similes and revealing words about what it is to uncover something. Of course to reveal and display, display or exhibit, expose, detect and discover encounter, find, unearth, even dredge up or dig up, <laughs> extract. All these words um, I find very interesting in respect to what Angava has been for me in this last couple of weeks. Every month I usually share something about what has been happening for me in relation to my practice and, and others around me in their path. But in this, uh, this teaching today, which is, you know, really to talk about the insight of the Dharma um, in some way that seems very real for us. I know you get a lot of Dharma talks which are lectures from the texts and I'm not so uh, profound in such teachings but I certainly can look into my life from a Dharma perspective. This has been the virtue of practicing for a long time. And in the, the way that the, the, the Buddha has revealed and uncovered layers in his own search for the truth, all of us here, when we are looking through the, the prism of Dharma, through the spectrum of Dharma, are uncovering very deep truths about ourselves. Usually, it brings with it some pain, as we all have experience. But often, just clarity to be able to look more deeply into what our life is about. I'll give you a little story to start with, a Buddhist story. It is a story about a slave by the name of uh, Punika and a Brahmin. And Punika was uh, the water carrier. And she also was a follower of the Buddha. She had heard the Buddha's teaching and through her experience of her work and her suffering in her life, she had come to some realization of the Buddha's truth. And one day when she was going down perhaps the Ganges or somewhere in India to collect wood to water, she saw a Brahmin uncovering his body to bathe in his daily ritual of purifying his mind. And she asks the Brahmin, on such a freezing cold day, why would you expose your body to this chill? You know, what is it that you are afraid of, that you have to be so dedicated to your ritual, even on such a day? And he responds. You know the law of karma. He said, I'm washing away all my evil acts. 
and she's very sharp. She says, who told you that this would work? Who told you such a ritual would benefit you in this way? Now, I'm at, you know, I'm actually from a tradition, and we have all, all Buddhist traditions have quite a lot of ritual, even Theravada, as I've discovered. And I'm not one who usually criticizes or points out the faults of other traditions, rituals, because I know even from my own practice, they have been very beneficial. And even one ritual, I believe, kept me on this path um, and healed me at that time through the faith and the practice of bowing my tradition and uh, dedicating my mind and focus to, to this. Then my body healed and I had the strength to continue as a nun at the time. So I'm not personally making a critique of the Brahmin washing here, but she has some very good points. She says, if this was so, if just bathing can clear away all our karmic obstacles and enlighten us, then so turtles and frogs and water snakes <laughs> would all go to heaven. Even the evildoers evil like the butchers, the thieves, the executioners would all be cleansed by just having a bath. Besides, wouldn't water then too wash away your good merits? She's very astute. She is a slave who actually, if she wastes any time, is beaten and cruelly punished. Still, she takes the time to talk to this Brahmin. It would be better to avoid unwholesome acts in the first place, wouldn't it? A lot of us come to meditate because we have all sorts of problems in our lives. We come to do our rituals, our daily rituals of offering and repentance because we feel we have done something wrong. We know we have done something wrong. But her point about it, isn't it better to not do this? Knowingly or unknowingly. Unknowingly is a little harder. <laughs> Requires a little more skill. And the Brahmin see. Oh, so then she says, spare yourself from this freezing cold weather and water and go home. The Brahmin sees the wisdom in her words and he offers up his robes. You can imagine the Brahmin's robes are worth something possibly a high Brahmin, but she refuses. She is not interested in the robe. And instead suggests he should take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And as he left, he said to her, your words have cleansed me. Just your words have helped my mind see some way forward, some clarity, some wisdom. There are many layers, of course, to this story. And uh, basically, Punika, through her practice in the Dharma, has great insight and has gained tremendous clarity of mind in regards to what's right and wrong. And she has the capacity to transform the mind of another, even one who is more educated and of a higher social level. Can you imagine a slave going up to a Brahmin and telling a Brahmin what to do? Even in India at this time, can an untouchable go to a Brahmin and say, look, you know, 
So she is somebody who not only through her wisdom has gained insight, she has gained the strength to act and point out what is not useful. You know, how many of us actually face a difficult situation or something that we really feel is politically incorrect, socially wrong, and point out and say, no, you know, this is not helpful to you, your family, this society, not enough of us. Not enough of us. There is also another perspective in this, which is back a little bit into that story, is why we do things. What brings us or encourages, incites us to do something purely based on belief? that somebody else said so. The Buddha warned us against this in the Kalama Sutta. Don't just do something because you believe it will enlighten you, believe the teacher is saying the right truth or the tradition is old. Not just because of all these beliefs he laid out, but because when you do it, it brings some contentment, some joy, some wisdom, and some purpose. I want us all to go through a little exercise. Now, I don't want you to go too deeply here into some grave, deep, heavy thing you have done. <laughs> but I want you to take a light one. It's just a little exercise, again, to help uncover something which is layered in conditioning. Conditions that we have from maybe a very young age, established in a way of believing. So for a moment, I just want you to close your eyes and rest in where you are sitting now. Just take a moment to just witness and sense your body with your feet on the ground or your legs folded in front of you. Just relax. Relax your posture and your attention on just what feels really solid and real. Our breath is very subtle, so we won't go into the very subtleties of our breathing at this moment, but I just want you to feel what's really solid and real. Your bottom against a cushion or a chair. Your clothes against the body. Your feet on the floor. Your legs perhaps pressed one against the other. Your hands resting on your lap. These are all things that make us feel this sense of being this body. We notice also in doing this, there are subtle changes of energy, attention to different parts of the body or energy in our feet and hands, pulsating in our feet and hands, heat, all these things are telling us that something's going on physically for us. Now I want you to turn a thought inward while you're experiencing your feelings and your solidity of body. I want you to take a simple thought 
about a recollection of something where you felt knowingly you did something wrong. As I said before, nothing too heavy, just something very light. You said something, or you did something as a child. And for this moment, while you're thinking about that, I want you to experience what that feels like for you in your body. Has your awareness changed? Is there still some sense of that, that some sense of discomfort or uncomfort around this memory? If it's very light, it may be quite insignificant, but the fact that you remember it at this moment, it still holds a thread of behavior for you. Do you recall whether you felt guilty or fear or anxiety or anger? Maybe you're enjoying it just as a teenage bully. I want to take the view a little bit further. Was anybody else involved? Was it just something you did for yourself, about yourself, or was it something that others were involved? Does that bring weight to how you feel? Does it strengthen the negative or positive emotions? Maybe it was a, a collaborator as a young sibling who often stick to, together to defend each other against the parents or a workmate against an establishment or a boss. But in this case, it is something clearly in your mind as a wrongdoing. Now, it's not being brought up here as a judgment, but a little exercise. Now, there may be two outcomes. One, you are caught out. The spouse knows, the kids know, the boss knows, a friend knew. Maybe the police get involved or a social worker or a lawyer. And how did that feel for you? And the other scenario is nobody knew. It never was found out. Maybe you're still doing that. Maybe it's become a pattern or a habit. That negative action has become part of your nature. What does that feel in this moment? Maybe you haven't even thought about it until today. And it's very light. If you were caught out, did you feel some very strong emotional and physical pain? 
Were you angry, judgmental, argumented, argumenting and justifying what you did? Even though you knew it was wrong, maybe it was a small wrong to gain a greater right. So you're arguing your point. Or when you were caught out, did you just feel a great sense of relief? A sense of expansion and opening in your mind? A sense of uncovering, releasing, letting go? If so, you may feel more free and clear and you may have gained some insight and wisdom from this. Everyone in this room creates uh, at this moment a room full of energy which has a lot of ambivalence, a lot of complexity, a lot of memory, sometimes pain. But an every very interesting thing, if I look out there, what I see is all just in my mind. It's all a perception. I am not reading your thoughts or concerned about what you're doing or not doing or did or not didn't do. But what I notice is a room of people in my mind. If I clear that, if this room becomes clear, just as if all those thoughts, laden thoughts, that web of connection, the web of emotion around this one little action, if the room containing that web of memory is some how just cleared in this moment, what would that feel for you? What would that be for you? How would that feel? All that guilt that memory of pain and anxiety, maybe loneliness that came from it, that would all go. That is all just part of what is collected in that space, in your mind. That's all connected to that one recall. That is quite easy to let go, as you may have found. But what if you are still doing it? Just like the Brahmin going every day down to do this ritual which was just making him more fearful, very cold. And maybe he wasn't changing his behavior at all. Maybe he was still doing things that were unwholesome. This is more difficult. Because the habit becomes more developed, more ingrained. The justification and reasoning become very solid. And so we form in our mind not only a behavior and a pattern, but a reality of certain behaviors that are very unwholesome. Okay, I'll have you just open your eyes again. Now you can see just from this little exercise how you can take an issue and allow it to 
just be there while you observe it, inform it, look at it very honestly. Understand it. Understand where it has come from. Understand the causes and conditioning that has helped it grow and helped it stay there. The fact you picked that particular thought today, even though I said just a light one, a simple one, it's still there in your mind. And it's imbued with so many other thoughts and experiences, as you may have seen. I can see you nodding. In this last month, the last two weeks actually, I um, did the a 49th death ceremony for, I think I talked about the passing of this very good Buddhist elderly man who'd become a scholar, a Pali scholar, and his family asked me to do a 49th ceremony. Actually, the family are not Buddhist. All his children are wonderful. They all act like Buddhist, but no one claims to be Buddhist other than the father. This is a common thing now. And it was so interesting. As this beautiful ceremony was unfolding, revealing itself, and I left a lot of space for everyone's personal expression and, and place to communicate, to be there. So as we offered ashes, they planted a beautiful tree. Um, and they offered ashes, the family all offered a little bit of ash. Others offered incense. And there was this gathering around this memory, the memorial tree. It was very intimate, it was very beautiful. You know, people don't realize how positive a 49th <laughs> ceremony is. It is ritual. But, you know, at a, at a funeral, everyone's so emotional. And I heard of another funeral yesterday where the brother didn't even mention the sisters when his sister passed away, didn't even mention his other sisters in the, <laughs> in the ceremony because somehow complexities and separations had grown. So funerals can be very intense and can be very still very full of the person who has just passed in your life. But after 49 days, where people have had time to reflect, release a little, uncover many stories and recollections, then there is a quietness that comes to this ceremony. It's not a paste, no, nothing has to be done quickly. We did several layers to it. And um, the very young children went and picked other flowers and put around the tree. But as the day unfolded, there was this unlayering, just listening. I was there till nine o'clock. <laughs> at night, <laughs> eight o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night. And listening, each family member and their partners would come up and their friends to have a little chat. And it was all about the relationship, things that had happened with the father, the friend, the spouse. And in this uncovering, by just listening, they revealed so many things. Not that I need to share or recall them, but in saying, there are often things that were quite difficult. You know, if you've ever been to an Irish 
funeral, everybody gets up. My father was of Irish blood. And everyone at the funeral gets up and tells everyone very blatantly all the terrible things that person has done. And <laughs> all the negative things. And all done in great humour and everyone laughs and all the funny stories. And that's an Irish funeral. So it's out there straight away. But in the Western funerals, it's <laughs> the other cultural funerals, it's often a little bit covered. So nothing had been said. I, you know, I've only known this lovely man and all the beautiful things he's done in his life from a Buddhist perspective. And here he was, so many other facets of a person, a human being. Indeed, maybe when the children were very young and he was a at-home dad, he may have been a little hard or he may have done things they disagreed with. Some of these things were in the minds and the memories coming out. It is this uncovering. Uncovering of layers of who we are. Our stories. all our life projects and who we wanted to be and all our interests. In a Zen teaching, we would, in the uncovering of practice and life, we look very much first to a practice that empties the mind very quickly stabilizes, strengthens, and emptying. So if you've ever seen any Japanese Zen movies or something, you know, there is a pace and a rigor and a, a strong intention to dig deep into these very difficult places very quickly. So early Zen life's quite painful, as I've shared. But the point here is we're trying to get into who is this person I think I am? Who, who is Jigwang? You see me in these robes, you might come and listen to a Dharma talk, but in this room I don't know if anyone really knows who Jigwang is. Rani knows a little bit. <laughs> After sharing a few nights at her house, you have a little more time to share stories. But you only ever see this person sitting up here, sometimes sharing something you like and sometimes not. But we, we do this practice and live in this path to discover in all the good and the bad, in all those feelings that you experience from delving into one negative memory, one memory that you felt was unwholesome. If that memory was one little cell in our body, can you imagine a body full of cells that have a recall that is not so positive? How do you uncover that? How do you learn to be with that? And so it reminded me of a movie one, I once saw, a very interesting movie called Pastoral Hide and Seek. It's a Japanese movie. I saw this back in the 70s, I think, mid-70s, and I never forgot it. Because in this movie, you see the scene of a little country village town and very traditionally lived out with the costumes, the, the, the clothes they wore. And it's about a young boy telling the story of all who did what in the town. Who was married to who, who was having affairs, who went crazy, who died, who was born. He's telling the story. 
And because it's in a very traditional way, it's fascinating. You know, you're sitting there absolutely enthralled. Then suddenly the story stops. It, the plot doesn't seem to be going anywhere other than revealing, uncovering what went on in this little town. Then the story stops. And what happens? There's the director and the screen and the scriptwriter sitting together. And the scriptwriter says, I'm really stumped on how to finish this. And the director says, well, maybe you need to go back and tell the story how it really happened. And the second half of the movie is retelling the real story. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, nothing quite happened in the way we saw it in the first story. The person who had the affair wasn't someone else but the young man. <laughs> but he couldn't own that. So he placed it on another figure in the town. <laughs> who married who was a little different. And the lady who went crazy. She never went crazy. She was just an eccentric lady who was a performer. So isn't that so interesting? So then the story could be finished. And what happened at the very end is suddenly this town is focused down to one building. And in that one building are all the performers and all the walls collapse and you see just the characters as they are in real life. Now, without the uniforms and the masks. Such an interesting movie. I was probably in my, a teenager when I saw this. And all these years, it said something to me about how I see what I think is reality how I judge others, how I judge myself. And there was, uh, I had to just to share another little um, story from my own personal life. Um, I had to write an article for a Korean magazine um, to do with my early life in Korea. And they wanted three chapters. So the first chapter was about my early Buddhist life and then going to Korea and telling the story on the way and then meeting my teacher. And my teacher says this, uh, this seemingly in incoherent number of questions. He, he asks me these very, what I thought at the time, silly questions. I mean, they made sense, but I didn't really understand why. And he was asking me, well, if there is a body with outer mind, what is it? I could answer, but he wasn't really asking me that. He wasn't really asking me for the answer of a spirit. I answered and he just smiled. And it was only when writing this article, I got the real point of what he was asking. He was really asking me to uncover and reveal the power and the strength of my own spirit, my own mind, my own awareness. What is this spirit in me? What is this life in me? What is this purpose in me? The questions continued. What is it to have a mind and uh, no body? Again, he is asking, 
What is it that's dead in you? What is that corpse you're carrying around? And I, you know, for years and years and years, I've just been thinking about the conceptual obvious out there, the dead body out there. What is it that is a wholesome human, to be a, a good human? Again, I'm looking at that good human. He's asking me in that moment, show me your humanity. Express that in some way. Express your kindness, your wisdom. Of course, you know, I've been practicing for some years, thought I was pretty good at meditation, thought I'd accomplished some sort of equanimity and got on with people. I was a good cook, I could build, I could live in community really well. You know, I thought I was starting to really have my feet on the foundation of the path. But I realize now in these questions, no wonder he was laughing. I was thinking, gosh, she's got a way to go. <laughs> Another 40 years later, and I'm still thinking. Only now I look at that and I go, but that's what he was asking me. That's what he even asked you all the time I've gone and studied in Zen monasteries in Japan and other places. Didn't get that very first introduction. And then when he asks me, you know, what is it has a strong mind and a strong body? You know, he's asking me to show my Buddha body, my Buddha mind, my body mind, my enlightened mind. And all I could give him was the name of the Buddha. Can you see what we do? We tell everybody the teachings, but we're not necessarily living it. We give the answers. We love to express the Dharma, but are we living it? Or are we still living the fantasy of that young boy in the village, thinking we know when we sat with that little thought before about something we did that was wrong, how many of you could really sit with that without adding to it? Without trying to make it right? Without trying to just, well, I was only a kid, justify it. So interesting, very few of us can do that. We so quickly want to make it right. Yes, the Buddha wants us to understand the Dharma, to make it right. But he really wants us to understand the Dharma, to uncover what is not right, what is not working, what are patterns of behavior that have crept up and grown and become character, become what you see in Qi Guang's face, not that any of you see it. If you see the loneliness, the sadness, the weakness, the vulnerability, the fearful, in another, then you have the capacity to see that in yourself. If you're only looking and seeing a strength, a quality, a nun, <laughs> a Dharma teacher, these are all good, but limiting because then you will say, I'm not that. Or you may say that, I'm not that. But actually, everything you see and hear and do, you are that. Very difficult to own it, isn't it? Just like in that thought, everything that grew out of that one thought, 
those recollections, those entanglements, who else became involved, who else knew, even the weight to carry it on your own. A little thing you did when I, I remember pinching a pound from my mother's purse. Full confession here, I was about <laughs> eight and it was the end of the year and I, I had nothing to buy or the other kids in class had been buying everybody something. Mum forgot to give me pocket money to buy something. So I pinched a pound and bought everyone some lollies. <laughs> My mother turned up at school, called me into the corridor. She said, by three o'clock tomorrow, I want that pound back in my purse. <laughs> there was no fuss, no extra words. Very simple. I wasn't further reprimanded. Well, did I work hard for the next 24 hours. I, I scavenged <laughs> every street in that, that suburb for for Coke bottles, <laughs> empty Coke bottles, and, <laughs> and what I could sell and what I could make a penny for <laughs> to get that pound back in my mother's purse. <laughs> I learned my lesson very early. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for um, listening today. And uh, there's always a moment, or a few moments, for anyone who has a question. Um, perhaps a little difficult topic on some levels and it'll help you reflect in coming days but as the topic is labelled uncovering allow it to uncover allow it to point to and to guide you it is only through our mistakes do wisdom grow. It is only that how, how old that Brahman was, nothing is revealed, but how many years he'd been offering himself in such a ritual. Still, it is a practice done today by many and still believed by many, so I cannot overly criticize the traditions and their rituals. But in him, he saw some wisdom. Just as in you, by uncovering some layers, we can reveal more wisdom. Good.